Recently, I've been coming to think of practice in terms of uh, the distinction between formal practice and what I call life practice or practice in life. So, uh, each day, uh, formal practice, what characterizes formal practice is that a uh, period of formal practice lasts at least 10 minutes. So there's a sort of duration aspect. And all your attention is going into maintaining the technique. That makes it formal practice. Um, there are two basic kinds of formal practice. Practice in stillness, where you're not moving much and practice in motion where you are moving. You could be walking, you could be exercising, and so forth. So I would encourage a person who wants to be successful with this path to do a little bit, uh, a minimum of formal practice in stillness and formal practice in motion each day. What's a minimum? 10 minutes. Now that's minimum. You might not, you, that might sound like not very much, but uh, you'd be surprised how much resistance a person might have to doing that. Um, it's not a time thing. A anybody has 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there to do formal practice. It's not a time thing. What, then what is it? Well, um, you might say that the, ordinary coping mechanism, uh, the normal coping mechanism that people have for dealing with life could be characterized as tighten up and turn away. Um, the new coping mechanism of this practice is the diametric opposite of that. It's open up and turn towards. Now, you could think of the old coping mechanism as sort of being like um, uh, uh, how you've been getting air. Um, it's, it sort of works, okay? Um, but not really. So if you start to challenge that coping mechanism um, by forcing yourself to have periods of open up and turn towards, at some point it might seem to your conditioning that you're like being asphyxiated. You got to get a breath, a breath of air. In this case, a breath of air is a hit of unconsciousness. <laughs> the the practice is <clears throat> it's like. You, your oxygen is being taken away, okay? Your former s source of nutrition is being taken away. You're starving to death. You, uh, you're, you're flailing. Um, and the only way to get nurtured or to get oxygen is to start to go completely unconscious again for long periods of time. And formal practice won't allow you to go completely unconscious for long periods of time. Um, so it seems like you're starving to death or you're being asphyxiated. Uh, and that resistance then comes up. And it's not a time thing. It's this other mechanism. Um, so what to do in that case? Well, recycle the reaction, get interested in deconstructing the resistance. Um, so in terms of formal practice, 10 minutes, of stillness, 10 minutes of motion, most days. Practice in life, I've been dividing into what I call micro hits and then background practice. So micro hit is short um, and it's happening during ordinary life. And you could, you, at the end of the day, you can say exactly how many of them you did, how long they lasted and when they took place. Um, and that's a way of tracking the extent to which you are stopping on a dime, starting on a dime. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, stop on a dime means that you suspend your investment with the content of in and out. Mm -hmm. You suspend your investment with 
the pull of past and future. Um, and you establish an investment, 30 seconds here, three minutes there, with maintaining um, a, a technique. What technique? It could be any technique. So you, you um, what's a technique? Name a technique. Here in. Uh, here in. Okay. Uh, here in was the first one. Here rest. Your rest. There's not going to be much here in. I'm doing the technique, okay? After a while, there might be some here in. <laughs> but I was just showing you, I could start on a dive. We go a little broader, see out, gone, feel in, gone, feel rest, feel rest, see rest, see out, gone, see out, gone, feel in, gone, see rest, see flow, see flow, okay. No hesitation. No, well, I'm going to sit here and count my breath for 10 minutes and then I'm going to be settled enough to know what's going on. <laughs> no, that is not starting on a dime. 10 minutes, uh, even 10 seconds. 10 seconds is too long. Um, I'd be, um, <clears throat> between the stimulus and the response, there is a gap, and it's not long. <laughs> Couple seconds, maybe. Um, and after that, the terrorists are in the cockpit, running the show. <laughs> Emotional hijack, <laughs> amygdala, um, <clears throat> amygdala hijack. So uh, we need to train ourselves to stop on a dime, start on a dime. Stop on a dime doesn't necessarily mean that you stop moving around. It means that you instantly, you instantaneously suspend involvement with the content of in and out. And you are involved with the technique. But it doesn't have to be long. It could be while you're walking around, uh, even talking to people and so forth. So that's the micro hit. It can be any technique you want. Uh, <clears throat> the um, uh, the, the places where you attend to do micro hits during the day are dead times when you're waiting in line or you're in a meeting and it's this vacuous conversation <laughs> going on that are, you don't really need all your CPU uh, to, you know, sort of look like you're paying attention. Uh, so it's sort of like the dead times. The dead times become the, the, the magic times. You're waiting for your system to reboot. Okay, um, I had this idea once to create a, uh, a Dharma virus that <laughs> it would cause, pe cause people's computers to suspend operation until they had done 30 seconds of a technique. They have that on a Mac, it's called the beach ball of death. The beach ball of death? The whirling ball, oh. and it's having a hard time, that for me is mine. Yeah, uh, yeah right, so that's, those are the, these are those, uh, those the, the sort of dead times. Then, then there's um, the times just before and just after what you think is going to be a stressful event. You can have a stress rehearsal. You know, a dress rehearsal is stress rehearsal. It's like uh, I have one uh, student that uh, uh, basically his entire life is telephone calls, and it's and most of the calls are telling. Um, uh, passionate and powerful people know. And so th these are sometimes difficult calls to make. So he's, he, 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 he can use focus in now. I taught him focus in. Just 30 seconds, okay? He just prepares himself, watches the resistance, you know, it's, oh my God, I'm calling so-and-so and I'm telling them, news they don't want to hear, um, 
And then he could just make the call, and if there's any after whatever, another 30 seconds, clears it, ready to move on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, before and after stressful things, micro heads. Now the beauty of the concept of micro head is uh, you can check in on your own practice in a very tangible way. There's no BS, okay? Because how many did you do? When did you do them? What was the technique? For how long did they last? Um, that will tell you how many times during the day you are um, uh, you are severing the trammels of time. Um, <clears throat> okay, then what do I mean by background practice or having a, tech, a background technique go? Well, a lot of people report something like this. It's like, well, I don't go completely unconscious, but I'm not putting a lot of intention in having a technique going, but it's sort of going in the background while I'm going about life activities. Um, and some people are able to have that going much of the day. It's not sharp, it's not, there's no mental labels or anything, or maybe not much of that, but it's sort of going in the background, as opposed to just the way I used to be, where I would just completely be lost and unconscious and driven uh, and so forth. So uh, that kind of thing may or may not come naturally to you. If it does, it's just something to know about. It's a component of practice. If it doesn't come naturally for you, that's okay. But the one thing everyone can do, because it's so well defined, and so crisp is the micro hits. Like I say, okay, if you're serious about this practice, you're gonna have a half dozen or so micro hits every day. And the, the less you feel like stopping on a dime, the more powerful doing so is going to be. When you least want to stop on a dime, when you're most caught up, in um, the bondage of past and future, inside and outside, is when it's going to be most powerful to stop on a dime. Um, <clears throat> you can use spoken labels to ensure quality, uh, because it's not going to be quantity, right? It's going to be short, <laughs> um, if your life situation allows for it. Um, for me, Often the stop on a dime uh, feels like I'm going to die. Mm. It feels like I'm being marched off to the, a firing squad or something. Um, and that's good. That means I'm doing it right. That means I really am going toe to toe uh, with the forces of um, the somethingness of self and world. Uh, so, um, that gives you potentially f four elements. Formal practice, practice in life, formal practice you have stillness, motion, practice in life you have micro hits, background practice. And with regards to the formal practice, for practice in stillness, two accelerators, trigger practice, and duration training. For practice in motion, the challenge sequence. It's all described in great detail in the reading we sent you. If you line up these elements, if you at least occasionally do the accelerators, push the envelope of the length of a sit at least occasionally, under the parameters described, um, um, Occasionally explore systematically triggering hot and cold buttons. Um, try to do not just practice in stillness and not just walking meditation, but 
you know, can I do focus in while I'm washing the dishes? Okay, how deep can I get with focus in while I'm washing the dishes? Focus out on the way to work, etc., etc. So you give yourself the motion challenge sequence, at least occasionally. So those would be the ducks that you would want to line up for day-to-day -day practice. If you line up those ducks for day-to-day -day practice, what else is left? Well, um, at least once a year do the equivalent of a one-week retreat. That's absolute minimum. Um, when I say the equivalent, not everyone in the world can get away for seven days or ten days to do a residential retreat. In fact, most people can't. But there are ways of doing the equivalent. For one thing, the home practice program, which we created, which almost anyone can do as long as you speak English um, um, and you have can get cheap long distance, or, or you have internet with Skype, um, then you can have a retreat practice. You just have to sort of amortize it uh, uh, over the years, spread it out. Um, but uh, a four hour or eight hour program, um, if you did enough, several of those, many of those over a year, that sort of will serve as your retreat practice. During retreats, as you see, you build up a certain momentum, then you go back to your daily regimen, and instead of that being a peak experience, it, it may go down a bit, but it becomes a stable plateau. You now grow gradually with your daily elements, and then um, go do your next retreat. And then as you look over the big picture of the years and decades of practice, what you'll see is, as a general trend, the retreats take you to a new level. The daily practice backs it up with more modest growth. And so you have this sort of stepwise growth curve. And if you look at the overall envelope of the curve, uh, at some point it becomes evident that it is in fact exponential. Um, when, is, when does the break point in this exponential curve come? The break point means when it goes from looking modest and linear to, oh my God, this is really taking off. That's the, that's the point at which the derivative starts to go in, infinite. The, the break, break point occurs um, <clears throat> when uh, you start to get uh, the uh, immediate uh, taste of purification. As soon as you bring equanimity to an experience, you don't have to wait. You just bring the equanimity to it and you sense that sources of unhappiness are breaking up. You can actually taste it happening. Uh, I can't put it into words, okay? Mm. It's the Vishuddhi Rasa. I made up a word, a word in Sanskrit. This word should exist in Sanskrit. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> Vishuddhi means purification. Rasa means taste. There's a taste. Um, it, and it's impossible to put into words, but once the spiritual palate matures so that you can taste it, that's the break point because now you're reward now you're now you're dealing with operant conditioning skinnerian conditioning it's a positive feedback loop it's just classic math um the uh, the taste of purification it can't be put into words but as i say its acquisition marks the transition to a mature spiritual palette um, there are tastes that kids just don't understand. Mm. Why would anyone drink coffee? <laughs> um, most kids can't understand spicy foods either, I, I think. It's like, wh why do adults put this in their mouth? It's bitter. It hurts. You know, there's not a taste called spice. 
Mm. You know what spice is? Mm. Spice is pure pain. <laughs> it's the it's the raw it's the raw nerves. It's it's the actual the same nerves that give you a pain signal are what are stimulated by capsaicin. Um, um, in fact, that's a way of inducing lab pain. But anyway, that's so. Um, the uh, uh, why would anybody like something? that hurts in their mouth. Why would anybody like anything that's bitter? Most kids cannot understand why adults eat this kind of stuff. But the palate changes. So there's a taste that comes about when a person experiences pleasure or pain with equanimity. And the, and the taste is identical. Doesn't matter whether it's with physical pain, emotional pain, physical pleasure, or emotional pleasure. There's a, a knowing that because of the way I'm greeting this in this moment, the poison and pain from previous moments is being wiped away, and every moment of the future will be marginally uh, less suffering and more fulfilling. It's a kind of knowing of that. When that reward flavor, the taste of purification, which is just the taste of equanimity, or the effect of equanimity, when that comes on, that's when the growth curve goes like this. Because now, now the preoccupation with feeling good is starting to go away. You're, you're, you've got an, another kind of feel good that's, that's not the old kind of feel good, okay? It's, it's just its own thing. And it's available on demand. So either you feel good intrinsically, or you don't feel good and you have equanimity and you feel good. So now you just, it just takes off. That's when the, it goes like that. So if you can get this, these elements in place, um, <clears throat> then, uh, you'll be in good shape. The day-to-day -day rhythm, formal practice, practice in life, stillness, motion, micro hits, background practice, accelerators at least occasionally. You, do, you have that day-to-day, -day. you have retreats. If you're fortunate enough to do residential retreats, great. Uh, but some intensive form of practice that's more than just a, a long sit. Um, what else do you need? Well, at least occasionally touch base with someone who's competent to guide the big picture of your practice. That's a very specific job. Um, you, can, you can have many teachers, um, <clears throat> but you need to have at least one person that um, knows how to guide people through the entire range of uh, classical experiences that this practice is meant to, uh, uh, can potentially, potentially bring about. Um, so you touch base with that person once, twice a year to talk about the big picture of your practice.